okay so good morning distinguished ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the second day of the nigerian gas association multilogs a series of conversations that is addressing pertinent issues in our oil and gas industry distinguished ladies and gentlemen and yesterday we had we began yesterday's event with an opening address by the president of the NGA, Mrs. Audrey Jo Ezibo, who raised critical questions in her welcome address, which put carefully um, and selected panel discussions into a policy debate on how to overcome price distortions that impede realization of industry aspirations in the gas sector. It also yesterday featured presentations and a subsequent panel session engaged engaged hundreds of participants who plugged in from different corners of the globe. In fact, that's one of the beauties of virtual events these days. We get to receive people from all parts of the world. Usually an NGA meeting will be those of us who are in Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, uh, and a few other uh, states around the country. But these days we receive people from different parts of the world all discussing the gas, uh, the importance of gas, and yesterday specifically on gas pricing. Part of what they were, they were looking at observations and, and making positions on how to transit uh, the domestic gas market from current dual pricing regime to full commercial liberalization. Um, these are just a few of the things that came up. Uh, conversations came around again, came out again on, you know, willing buyer, a willing seller. There were explanations as to why we cannot have export parity on the gas from the CEO who was looking at matters around dry and wet gas and, and, and things like that. Now, not to give you everything that happened yesterday, not at all. What is going to happen is the rapport was put together by Mojong Communication are working on a document that will be handed over to the NGA who would use it as a continuous document for as a document for continuous advocacy with um, the relevant government agencies and ensuring that we address the issue of gas pricing moving forward now that said we come into today where we'll be looking at a dialogue around the petroleum industry bill as it will soon be passed but before i get into that we'll take a re uh, an address from the opts who are critical very critical to everything that happens within the PIB, you know, moving forward. Now, after that, we're we'll going to a panel conversation. Now, that panel conversation will be discussing the presentations that would come from the president of the Nigerian Bar Association, who has, you know, also is available this morning to share with us. Now, that panel have resource persons from across our industry. I'll be moderated by a captain in the industry. Then we'll get to you, distinguished attendees, to ask your questions. Now, let me say this real quick. You can start asking your questions from the very first presentation. Locate the Q&A chat box and ask your questions. And once you do that, when it's time, we'll just lift it from there and attend to your questions. Once again, we welcome you. My name is Richmond Osuji, and I switch gears now to my first presentation, which is coming from the chairman of Oil Producer Street Section, Mr. Mike Stangster who is here today and um, represented. But Mr. Mba, before you take your presentation, you know, without our sponsors signing their checks behind this event, me and you will not be here to discuss whatever we have to discuss today. So give me another three to four minutes to play the videos of our indefatigable sponsors, the Nigerian LNG, Shell, and Axela. So please just watch your screens and I'll be back after those videos and we'll get Mr. Okemba talking.
the long-term modernization and economic growth of our societies is significantly dependent on energy. One such option is natural gas. This underlines Excella's commitment to ensure more industries embrace natural gas as a safer, more eco-friendly, and more cost-efficient energy option. We are successful at implementing models across the region to anticipate the energy needs of our clients while securing investments to expand our processing, trading, transportation and distribution activities. Via our subsidiaries, Excella is wholly committed to actively creating initiatives that provide social and economic benefits for our stakeholders in both host and access communities. We are big believers in safety, innovation, and evolution, which is why we implemented the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System to remotely monitor gas distribution across our operations. Connect with us on social media. We are Axela. We are empowering West Africa. Okay, thank you so much, Nigerian LNG, Shell, and Axela. You know, normally, if it was a live event, I would be asking the audience to applaud you for standing behind the Nigerian Gas Association. But hey, it's a virtual event, so there goes your applause from me. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we're now switching gears immediately to the OPTS Chairman, OPTS Gas Committee, representing the Chairman of OPTS, Mr. Mike Sangster. We welcome Okechuku Umba, a GM with Seplat. Okay, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Richmond. Uh, I will take a moment to put up the slides that I'm going to use for my presentation. Thank you and welcome to our audience. Um, this, is the, this is an address by Mr. Mike Sangster, the chairman of um, OPTS um, on the Petroleum Industry Bill um, 2020, as presented by me. I'll be pausing from time to time to move by slide please um, bear with me distinguished ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the all producers trade section opts of the lagos chamber of commerce and industry i thank you for the opportunity to present our views on the petroleum industry bill 2020. opts is an industry group operating under the umbrella of the lagos chamber of commerce and industry we represent the interests of 30 oil and gas companies and operate approximately 90% of Nigeria's oil and gas industry production in partnership with NMPC, other local and international leaseholders. As the cornerstone of the exploration, development, and production of Nigeria's vast petroleum resources, our collective objective is to strengthen the long-term health of the oil and gas industry. The petroleum industry bill has been a major, excuse me, the petroleum industry has been a major contributor to Nigerian economy and government revenues. Nigeria with the largest oil and gas reserves in Africa has huge untapped potential to achieve its economic development goals, including gas to power ambitions. The fundamental shift in global energy markets driven by advances in unlocking unconventional petroleum resources and increasing traction for cleaner energy sources has resulted in a global oversupply of crude oil, putting pressure on prices. This has been further worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
potentially putting at risk the viability of ongoing and future projects and driving fierce competition for scarce investments around the world. Furthermore, Nigeria's petroleum industry faces a number of country-specific challenges, including insecurity and inadequate infrastructure for domestic gas development. To underscore the challenges facing Nigeria's industry and its inability to attract funds, Nigeria will receive only $3 billion out of the $75 billion that will be invested in the continent of Africa for projects sanctioned between 2015 and 2019. This represents approximately 4% of the total investment in that time period. There is significant competition for finance in our industry. A fact with the COVID-19 crisis and the recent drop in oil, in oil price have only increased. PIB presents a unique opportunity to address these challenges in addition to providing, in addition to improving Nigeria's competitiveness to attract the scarce investment funds. I'll show you um, the, the slide that you looked at um, a moment ago um, shows you that Nigeria's, Nigeria's government take exceeds that of other countries for similar prolific deep water basins. You see Nigeria in the second bar, uh, ranking much higher than most of the other countries. And in the next slide, you also see that um, a promising deep water project in Nigeria facing relatively tough fiscal terms as compared to those of other countries. Government take in Nigeria's pre-FID decision in JV oil pro projects is also one of the highest in the world. We appreciate the progress made in addressing some of the industry's concerns in the PIB, such as the removal of hydrocarbon tax on gas, the maintenance of current tax consolidation principles for the purpose of companies income tax and the adoption and the option to stay on current terms until the end of current lease life. However, there are a number of areas of concern that still need to be addressed. The bill, if passed in its current form, will erode Nigeria's oil and gas industry competitiveness to the advantage of other regions in the world and will negatively impact future investment decisions, government revenues, and long-term growth aspirations of the industry. First, we are concerned that the PIB as currently drafted will not achieve these objectives. There are a number of, there are six key areas which in our view will help the PIB achieve its goals. And I'm going to go through those one by one. And the first is going to be on deep water. Deep water developments have been central to growing Nigeria's production in recent years. The current provisions, however, will not help launch new projects in the future. Deep water production is complex and capital intensive. To stimulate investments in new projects, OPTS recommends that the PIB grants royalty relief for the first five years of production and retain a single tax system in the form of company's income tax. Granting royalty relief period will enable companies to become strong contributors to the Nigerian economy, providing consistent royalty revenue to the government for years to come. I will now look at the need for a stable environment for investors. For companies to make decisions about investments, there must be clear, there must be a clear view 
of what lies ahead and have assurance that existing investments are secure. The PIB conversion terms currently do not ensure the continuance of existing projects as commercially and technically designed. The PIB conversion terms should allow the companies to keep the right to resolve the existing disputes and, and arbitrations, use tax benefits end in the deep, in the deep offshore, and maintain stabilize, stabilization and historical legislative and regulatory changes. While the bill enables companies to retain some of these rights, in the deep water, there are leases that will expire in the coming years. They will be lost with renewal of the leases. The bill is also not very clear on how and when NMPC's liabilities will be settled. Now I move on to focus on domestic gas. Nigeria has important gas resources which can satisfy both domestic obligations and export requirements to make gas a catalyst for economic development. However, the PIB does not incentivize and promote gas development to enable the transition to a gas-based economy, where gas pricing is reflective of the cost of delivering gas to the market. The PIB should aim to address bottlenecks in the gas value chain, such as inadequate infrastructure, legacy debt owed to gas suppliers, and regulated gas pricing. The next one will be capital allowances and deductions. The PIB fiscal terms, the PIB fiscal provision should seek to align with the existing tax principles to boost our investment confidence, investors' confidence, decrease the risk of disputes, and simplif simplify implementation. Currently, the deductions allowed and disallowed by PIB are not consistent with existing company income tax practices. Furthermore, costs eligible for deduction under hydrocarbon tax are excessively limited by the PIB concept of the cost price ratio limits of 65% of gross revenues determined. Now we'll talk about segregation of upstream and midstream deemed um, assets. Imposed segregation of upstream and midstream could jeopardize the integrity of current investments. The PIB should include savings provision to allow post-investment continuity of activities undertaken by a single legal entity and provide specific exemptions for all associated taxes where assets are to be segregated. Administrative complexity and the absence of robust dispute resolution framework is an, another area that needs attention. The PIB significantly increases the administrative burden of compliance. It introduces a dual tax system for multiple tenants and asks that companies submit different tax filing for different parts of their business. The PIB is also not explicit on which entity should be responsible for integrated operations that is downstream and, and midstream operations that are currently tied with upstream. Finally, it is critical to have in place a clear dispute resolution mechanism to strengthen investors' confidence. The current PIB 2020, the current PIB draft of 2020 does not improve the investment environment for new projects. By 2025, we should see about a 38% reduction in deep water production compared to 2020 levels. Over 30% of production potential may be lost by 2030. Production decline could partially be attributed to PSC assumptions. A competitive PIB could unlock Nigeria's production potential, contributing to the country's next wave of economic growth. With the right fiscal framework, OPTS could invest an additional $9 billion in deep water projects to grow oil and gas development in Nigeria, with a resultant 
the resultant benefits to the nation. PIB enabled projects have the potential to create 300,000 direct and indirect jobs over the next 10 years, including distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is our belief that the PIB presents an opportunity for the much needed reform and growth of the Nigerian oil and gas industry. The bill should create a platform not only for preserving existing government revenue, but also to incentivize new projects that will increase production and revenue for government and stakeholders, thereby guaranteeing long-term sustainability of the oil and gas industry. On behalf of OPTS members, we appreciate the opportunity to present our views today and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, now, um, thank you. I mean, that's giving us an OPTS perspective on the, the PIB they hope to see and their commitment to that PIB once it is out there, how much they want to put down and the kind of economic stimulation the investments will give Nigerians. 300,000 direct and direct jobs. Uh, the ripple effect can take that to 3 million if you look at it the way we live um, uh, as Nigerians. Thank you very much. Without most, uh, w w wasting much of our time, I just want to ask our, our distinguished attendees, if you have a question or two for OK Chuku Umba, uh, Chairman of the OPTS Gas Committees, speaking on behalf of Mr. Mike Sangster, the Chairman of OPTS, if you have a question for him now, can you just go to the chat box? I will take one question. If they come on time, I take two. One question. If you go to the chat, I won't take the question. The question has to come on the Q&A chat box. The question has to come on the Q&A chat box. Now, while we're doing that, um, OPTS, that was, that was um, quite um, stimulating. Uh, we, want to, we want to give you a round of applause um, for, for putting together um, that presentation. We, we, we truly appreciate you. No question. I'm going to give it another. Okay, one question. Just yes. Thank you very much. So we're bringing the we're bringing the feel of life events into the whole thing again. Obina Samson is asking, what what's your institution strategy and other gas producers to harmonize the onshore gas transmission system with the offshore shallow water gathering system? to service the domestic market, if possible. Share timelines to deliver gas to Nigerian homes based on FG PIB plan. <laughs> Obina Samson. Hmm. Okay, did you see, did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it's a, it's a very broad question. I'm not, I'm not sure I have um, specific answers to, to each of the questions that he has asked. But what I would say is as an industry, we work closely with relevant government agencies. So he's talking of uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure layout to deliver gas from both uh, onshore and offshore uh, developments into the domestic gas um, um, industry. So as OPTS, we are committed to uh, developing gas resources and making them available uh, to the domestic market. And we have been doing that. And we are always willing and ready um, to collaborate with different agencies and DPR as, as the regulator and uh, supports every um, move being made to increase supply of gas to the domestic market and play our part uh, to ensure that there are sufficient um, gas supply to the domestic market, knowing the ripple effect. Uh, as I said in my comments yesterday, the objective is to use gas as a catalyst for economic development and we want to convert this economy to a gas-based economy and um, OPTS is always ready and willing to play its part, um, but always looks for um, opportunities to dialogue with government to ensure that the right incentives are in place to enable the investments that will make these opportunities to be realized um, to be possible. That will be my response. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, OK. So we're switching gears now from OK's presentation to our lead presentation for this particular PIB dialogue, crystallizing sector legislation to spur wider development. The OPTS have given us, as it were, a teaser of what could happen if we get it right with the PIB. And this time we would go to, you know, um, our learned, our learned friends to talk to us on this theme for today. The President, Nigeria Bar Association, Mr. Olumide Akpata, is our lead speaker for this session. However, 
Mr. Akpata is unable to join us in person, but he has sent a reputable representation who is a partner and head of Odun, Odun Jiri and Adifulu's energy practice and real estate and mining teams. I like to now yield this virtual platform. Mr. Lumi Dakwata, represented by Dr. Adefulu, with an applause again. Thank you. Thank you. It is. Um, let me start by extending the warm regards of uh, Mr. Lumi Dakwata, the president of the Nigerian Bar Association. Unfortunately, he's not able to make it, but he has asked me to represent it. This is a topic that I've spent a lot of time on, and I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to have the pri privilege of representing him at the NGA Multilogs. Um, let me start with what I will finish with, which is that occasions such as this, discussion, discussions such as these, uh, are what will help us to crystallize sex, um, sector legislation that will spur wider development. Organizations like the NGA, like the NBA, like uh, PETAN, like OPTS, need to engage constructively with uh, the Nigerian government to help us develop the legislation that we are looking for. And that's that's kind that's that will be you know sort of the summary and the end of our discussion but um i'll go through a few slides um i i will in the short period of time that i have um i will have um i'll be discussing the context i think that the last speaker from opts has spent some time Kind of showing us what the context is but i will talk a little bit about that uh, but the major part of the presentation will be a deconstruction of the title that we were given which is crystallizing sector legislation to spur wider development so i'll talk a little bit about crystallizing sector legislation and why uh, sector legislation has not crystallized so far and then I'll talk about what spurring wider development should mean. And then at the end, I will give the recommendation, which I've already given to you, um, you know, which is essentially we need to work together to make this happen. Um, what is very interesting about the title that NGA gave to us is that there are so many, I think, so many hidden, uh, subtle, uh, bombs in that title that really suggest uh, that speak to the state of, of the development of the petroleum industry and uh, the petroleum industry bill which has been in process for quite some time um, giving you a global context uh, I, I know that many of you have listened to several PIB presentations and you will have seen this uh, but nonetheless, I think it's important to stress that one, uh, we've been dealing with COVID all year, 2020. Uh, you know, 2020 feels like 10 years uh, in one. We've had the lockdown, which has led to uh, demand destruction. And in many ways, even before, uh, even before the COVID-20, uh, COVID-19 happened, uh, the oil industry was already facing a number of significant challenges with competition coming from uh, um, uh, a number of other energy resources uh, and the issue of energy transition which uh, has spurred the move towards renewable uh, which is further developed through uh, better technology, cheaper pricing um, and the desire for the world to put an end to sort of the potential damages coming from CO2 emissions. Um, so we've been dealing with that even prior to COVID. But I think that the issue of COVID has kind of accelerated, um, you know, the demand for uh, uh, renewable resources and 
and potentially accelerating um, the fall of the age of oil. Now, many people uh, will tell you that uh, um, people have predicted the fall of the age of oil for, for the last decades. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that the age of oil will fall, but I'm saying that there is an acceleration, there is a difference, and the world that we're living in is certainly different from where we were in 2010, uh, where we were in 2015, and certainly uh, where we are now. And coupled with that is that there is a lot of competition. I, I think the last slide presented by Okechuku had showed where we were in terms of competitiveness. But this slide kind of demonstrates to us that um, as a country uh, in Africa, we were a dominant player uh, sort of 40 years ago, 40, 45 years ago. There were very few countries that you could find oil. But fast track into 2015, uh, the African map is covered in red. And the areas in red are where you can find oil and gas resources. And we expect that 2025, we'll, we'll see uh, more areas as well. And we've now found that other parts of the world, which were not players at all in the past, have suddenly come into, into being players. Guyana, Suriname, uh, all those players are, are coming into play. And so we have competition in terms of where investors and investment will go. We have uh, a constraint in terms of the ability of investors to invest their money into oil and gas. I mean, you find banks uh, stopping oil and gas investment. You find the World Bank proclaiming that they are not going to go into oil and gas investments any longer. So that's the world that we're living in. And that world is the world that we're trying to crystallize sector legislation. Therefore, the priority for us as a nation, as a government, as a people, in crystallizing sector legislation, recognizing the challenges uh, that we are facing, is that we must attract the level of investment. We must attract investment that is required to help us develop this oil and gas in, in a way that we can maximize the value from it and use that uh, maximize value and use that for um, for the betterment of, of the Nigerian economy. We've been here uh, through this process for a long time. Um, one of the things that I say now is when we when I certainly got involved in the process, um, Mr. Shusoya, who's also on the panel, uh, you know, he was right there when you know I got engaged in the process. To tell you that my hair was well, my beard was not this grey. Uh, if I had one, and I had hair on the top of my head, well, that's all gone now, and it's not because of um, it's not because of the barber's clip. Life has moved on. Uh, many people that started, uh, I mean, I knew a number of people that are well established that. Uh, um, you know, the PIB had not actually started when, when we kicked off their careers. It was 20 years. Uh, UJIC was established in 2000. Uh, we've gone through a process where the National Assembly never passed any form of the PIB. And then the National Assembly passed the PIB and the President refused to assent to the PIB. Well, passed the PIGB and the President refused to assent, it, assent to it. So where are we now? We are now uh, in a position where the executive has decided we're going to take the bull by the horn and we are going to send in a PIB to the National Assembly. And it's gone there. It's now uh, past first and second readings at both houses. And hopefully, we hope that there will be some form of public hearing in general. Why has it taken us so long I, I, I mean, I think that the summary of, of, of this is, is really an issue around stakeholders. Uh, the oil and gas industry seems to have more stakeholders than any other industry in, uh, in, in Nigeria. And I think that the unfortunate thing with 
putting the bill as a kind of omnibus bill is that the number of stakeholders and the divergent interest of the stakeholders uh, uh, you know begin to clash and you know I've, I've pointed out some stakeholders here and, and some of the issues that they may have some of the interests that they have you have got oil companies both in the upstream and the downstream upstream midstream and downstream who, who are thinking about profits and the rate of return they are very concerned about ease of doing business and they want to make sure that they have security of tenure and sanctity of contract and, and OPTS has already talked about that whose communities and whose communities tell you that they are they want they are the owners of the land and the owners of the oil therein and they want that recognized uh, the environmental issues development issues uh, that they are concerned about the Nigerian government well look I say the Nigerian government but even within the Nigerian government there are divergent interests you know the interest of the Ministry of Finance Ministry of, of FIRS are certainly different from the Ministry of Petroleum Resources and maybe different from that of DPR and all of them are different from that of NNPC but these divergent interests nobody has been able to coalesce uh, uh, and manage the issues around these divergent interests. And I'm not sure that even the PIB 2020 has been able to do so. Clearly, we're still hearing, you know, we've just heard from OPTS uh, what their views are. And this seems very divergent to the views that are expressed by the government, which uh, is telling us that this is uh, the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, spurring wider development, and I think this is a really important, and this is one of those things that uh, NGA has you know, kind of put uh, a, a subtle uh, dig in there. Uh, I'll just point some figures that I think is important for us to consider. The first is that uh, the oil and gas industry is just, just under 9% of the GDP. So when we are talking about a wider development, uh, uh, we, we are talking about how uh, the oil and gas uh, uh, industry can play a, a bigger role in the, in the wider Nigerian economy. And what we had before was essentially, uh, someone says we don't have an oil and gas industry, we have an extractive industry. So we extract, we export, we extract, we export. In many ways, that has not been the, you know, we've tried to, to develop a domestic market for gas, but that is still at uh, a very nascent stage. Uh, we've got the a huge uh, uh, potential of resources that we have discovered uh, mostly accidentally, but even the ones that we've discovered accidentally, we've not been able to convert that into value for our domestic market, for our economy, and for the companies that are operating therein. And if we go back to the earlier discussions around at the end of the age of oil, uh, the ability to extract, the ability to create value out of these resources, this 200.4 200, 200 TCF, this 37 billion uh, barrels of oil reserves, the time within which to do so is very, very short indeed spurring wider development and the key to this in many ways is gas i've talked about the end of the age of oil i've talked about the fact that uh, renewables are coming to play but renewables may replace uh, 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 they may replace hydrocarbons in terms of uh, electricity and, uh, and coal but the role that gas plays, which it will continue to play even in electricity, but it also plays a role as a feedstock for several industries. Uh, it plays uh, it plays that role, and that role cannot be replaced by renewables. So, in order for us to spur wider development, what we need to be doing is thinking about how our gas uh, that we found. And the one that we've not found, how that can be converted uh, to and brought into the market to develop um, uh, um, 
wider industry, to develop more industries, which will then go on to create more jobs and will have a catalytic effect on, uh, on our economy. Looks like I'm running out of time. So, having said all that, my concluding remarks, as I said at the beginning, is that we have, we still have a stakeholder management issue. We all got to work at that. But discussions such as these by organizations like the NGA, by OPDS, by NBA, they will help us to spur uh, uh, that opportunity to crystallize the kind of sector legislation that will bring us wider development. And I will hand over now to, to Richmond. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Adjoye Adefalu. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so we, we appreciate you for that insight and um, giving us that MBA perspective. That's our appreciation for your um, contributions. W one thing I just quickly say before I bring up our panel um, is the fact that I've had the privilege in the last couple of weeks to MC events, uh, oil and gas events across different parts of Africa, albeit virtually. And one thing that they're all saying is how they can best maximize their resources and how they are creating incentives for companies to come and invest in their countries. So we must get it right. We must get it right with the PIB. We, ha we have no choice. We're sentenced to do that. Thank you. Okay, so real quick, on our panel, I have the pleasure always of uh, introducing our first panelist, who for me is one of um, the sector, that's the gas sector's most brilliant and articulate mind, uh, currently the president of the Nigerian Gas Association, Mrs. Audrey Jo Ezibo, is on the panel. Ma'am, good morning and uh, good to see you as always. And then we have also on the panel, we have the chief executive officer of um, the company providing great value across the sub-region of West Africa, um, Axela Group. He's also a past president of the association, um, Mr. Mobolaji Oshunsan. Good morning, sir. We also have on the panel, um, the gentleman whom you've just listened to, representing Mr. Lumide Akpata. He's also on the panel. Uh, Dr. Deflu will continue on the panel. And then the chairman Shell Companies in Nigeria, Mr. Sagi Kuban, MD of SPDC. Um, he, he was supposed to be with us today. He was not able to join us. But this morning, we have representing him a general manager from the Shell Companies. We welcome Mr. Taj Shobayo. Good morning, sir, and welcome. And of course, the man who would always have an intelligent quote to start or end a session, I like to call him the group chief executive of the Oil Data Zenergy Group. Mr. Emeka Ene is the moderator for the session. Mr. Ene, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Richmond, and uh, welcome. I want to welcome everybody, our panelists, um, to this uh, session guys we need to be mindful that there's an energy transition going on and uh, the PIB and legislation needs to enable and maximize value but we have complex interests in our country and uh, and we have to work together to make it happen the key to increasing our GDP is gas so I mean this really sets the stage and uh, we have less than an hour to uh, to deal with these issues we have a very uh, um, uh, smart and articulate uh, panel and uh, I would like to kick it off straight away with uh, uh, five minutes comments, opening comments from uh, each of the panelists. I'll start with you uh, Audrey if you don't mind uh, on, on the topic crystallizing uh, uh, value maximization if you like uh, through the PIP legislation. Um, Audrey just for opening comments and if you want me to give you some questions I have a lot of questions to give you <laughs> just for <opening> comments. <laughs> all right thank you Emeka and again a very good morning to all the distinguished panelists ladies and gentlemen um, so NGA thought that this topic is really um, critical to the narrative of Nigeria at this point in time and of course we've heard it said endlessly we're facing several headwinds. We're also facing a recession at this point. And as I said yesterday, that we have barely had time to come out of uh, the last recession, but we're seeing a situation where our GDP 
um, is at a level that is the lowest it has been in 30 percent and on the other side of course the population statistics we're still seeing the numbers growing we're still seeing the unemployment trend getting worse and um the conversation around the impact of the oil and gas sector as an enabler, especially our gas sector, as an enabler is why the narrative of um, gas development continues to come to the fore. So when we look at the PIB, we've been on this journey now for almost 20 years. As Adeo said, they always said that um, he used to have hair and uh, not gray hair that matter, uh, for that matter. So we know that when we look at the the level of development, we have not done the best that we could have done. If you take a Ghana, for instance, we know that Ghana has their own PIB within five years. And you begin to ask why we should have then taken this amount of time. So the PIB is literally the single most important piece of legislative um, instrument since the, the Petroleum Act. And we recognize this, yet we have not fast tracked it. And so we've continued to struggle as a nation, even though we have all these lofty aspirations around um, lifting 100 million people out of poverty, ensuring energy sufficiency, industrialization and all that. Those things don't just come by making the pronouncements. Now, what I find interesting is that we know that, you know, every, if we look over the past um, two decades, practically, especially in the last 10, we have seen encapsulated in the policy pronouncements, the um, direction that goes in terms of you know, optimizing oil and gas, so whether it was the seven big wins, whether it was the economic recovery and growth plans, whether it's the national gas policy even that clearly articulates the intention to move us away from an oil export-based economy to a gas-based industrialized nation. Why have we not progressed this? And at this point in time that we're looking at the PIP 2020, we have to be sure that we get the right sets of um, inputs that will incentivize investments. So we can't get away from this narrative around investments, both locally and more importantly, externally, because of that competition, um, as everyone has alluded to, in terms of the available resources, in terms of the push towards um, renewable and i think another underlying factor is the economic environment that we don't have the most secure safe or sustainable of um, industrial uh, environments the frameworks are not clear so we need this legislation to come to the fore yes but it has to come to the fore in a way that makes sense now there are some things within the the policy and i think that in the in the main discussion we'll get into that in, inside the draft rather that seem to go against the tenets of even the national gas policy and that uh, we heard it from the, the upstream part, the midstream, the downstream. We should be talking about enablers, we should be talking about incentivization, but it's not clear that that is exactly what we're seeing. So there's a lot of engagement that is happening. Um, I know that um, that's the, uh, the closing remarks that um, Adeo put forward in terms of engagement. So even as the NGA, um, for the last, I've been on NGA council for over 14 years, and in every council, maybe save one, when there was quiet around the PIB, we were in discussions around uh, with the National Assembly, with different elements of government trying to push for the promulgation of this bill. At this point in time, we're still in those sets of engagements. We're working with OPTS, with IPPG, with um, even the LPG Association. We're, we're collaborating, we're working with the National Assembly, with the Technical Advisory Committee, and so on, just to make sure that this time around, we can get a workable bill passed. And that, for me, is the qualifier that is not just about passing the PIB anymore, it's about passing a workable bill that will enable the upstream, midstream, and downstream petroleum sector to thrive and then leverage on that to enable other sectors of the economy. So I'm going to leave it at that just for opening remarks. And as we get into the q and I'm sure we can do a further deep dive into some of the more specific um, areas. Emeka, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Audrey. That's a really, really interesting uh, stimulation. Um, I don't know uh, if uh, I can go swing to touch. Uh, touch. Uh, Nigeria is not attracting investment. I mean, uh, the presentation by Okechuku was, was very clear. I mean, yeah. we should be with all the reserves we have. But it's yeah. not happening. How can the PIB help this situation? I mean, it's, it's, this is really critical now. I mean, $4 billion uh, compared to uh, $70 billion investments in Africa alone. Uh, what's going on? Can the PIB help? Oh. Yes, indeed, uh, PIB can help, really. And uh, it's an opportunity we have, just uh, Mr. Dr. Adefuli says, uh, that the, during when he was making his presentation. The, the, the way I see all this is uh, we've come a very long way, um, and it's becoming tiring. 
even for people that have all the faith in this country. Um, uh, and it's connected to everything. The economy is an oil-based economy today, whether we like it or not. We are still trying to move away from that. So PIB is central to everything in this country. So, but, but the analogy of the PIB 2020, from my perspective, is a glass of water. Um, and you can view it either a half glass full or a half glass uh, empty. Um, but what is perhaps most important is the need to move on. Um, I have sat in a forum uh, organized by Nigeria British Chamber of Commerce a while ago, and there was a lot of energy that we should just move ahead. But knowing what I know about this sector, uh, I spent the decades in the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. Uh, wow. A little bit interrupted with some postings around Shell, uh, and I've spent time even in the in continents. There are times where I have responsibility across countries in Nigeria. I've seen this done easily and perhaps faster. And I think the cross of the matter is the interest, stakeholder management, that the way Doctor Defuli put it uh, more polishly. But I, I, I would actually like to open it up. There is a question of interest and people not being able to manage interest to come to a common interest. And until we do that, we are not going to make progress. If I look at the current PIB, there are a couple of positives in there. So there's the van role for institutional organs of government. So we see a good attempt to separate policy making from commercial activities and from regulatory activities. So that's good, that's positive, and I'm sure everybody likes that. There's the question of dual regulator or single regulator. Uh, the jury is still out on that, but what do we lose? What do we gain as a result of that? Dual regulator, more cost of governance for government, clearly more need for more administrative inconvenience for the industry, but we need to have PIB. And if we have to choose one of the two, if we don't, if we don't get the best, let's take the second best and move on. Um, PIB provides for grandfathering, uh, but from grandfathering is grandfathering with a lot of conditions. Uh, when I read it, it said, okay, are we talking about IMF load here? You know, that's what typically comes with a lot of conditionalities. That if you move this way, this is a consequence. Take for example, if you have a, if you, if you have a lease, grandfathering allows you to stay with the current law. But guess what? If you are close to renewal, you are in big, big problem. Because as soon as the point of renewal, you have to convert to PIB whether you like it or not. Well, maybe fear. But people see it as choice. But when you are close to renewal, it's not a choice really. It's not really a choice. And if you are if you are luckily you have a deep water investment and you are negotiating with the government and uh, you are not able to finish it by the time PIB comes into law. You don't have your lease anymore. You have to pick sections of your lease. And in picking that sections, depending on how you read the bill, you might be limited to 40% of your lease area, just like that. Uh, I see that as indirect expropriation of leases. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that they want the lease to be worked, given the shortness of time that Mr. Dufri mentioned, Dr. Dufri uh, talked about. But notwithstanding, we're a responsible state, for God's sake. We should do things a bit uh, uh, more fairly. So that, uh, because it's, it's small statements like this that investors read and they use to determine their mind of where they put to put their, their investable funds. So there are quite a lot of positives there. So tax rates are lower, but guess what? What you can deduct before you apply tax rates is all lower. So your effective tax rate is not what is it's not the headline tax rate that people are reading in the press. And uh, that alone is big discussion, but notwithstanding all this, I think we need to move on. We have an opportunity um, to move this bill forward. And what we need is simple, we need dialogue. We need dialogue. All interested parties need to state their positions clearly and a common front need to be fashioned out. Be a typical committee decision. You know, the committee decision is described as a decision of a camel that has a hump at the back. Uh, that's what we learned in management school. But notwithstanding, we'll, let's move on. Let's get something that satisfies the basic requirement. And I'm more passionate about issues around gas that will help the larger economy to grow 
and we can't wish oil away. We need those dollars in the next 10 years. You need money to create money. This is a time where I think our oil fiscal should be super competitive to encourage people that actually move in and say, hey, wait a minute, let's take advantage of this for the next 10 years that we'll be here. And we then expand gas massively. COVID has taught us that we also need to look at internal markets. You know, when we were all stuck at home and we couldn't do anything, it has taught us to be to internalize opportunities and look at threats differently. There's huge market in Nigeria. All we need to do is create the market in a way that we encourage invest because without that investment, just like uh, Audrey said, it is not possible to move forward. You can't reach investment. You can't compel investment. You need to attract it. And he that has the pipe, did say the tune. Government has part of the pipe because they keep the resources. But for the benefit of Nigerians, people need to move a little bit uh, sideways. Investors need to move. Government needs to move. And that's only that dialogue is what we require to move forward. I will leave it there while we discuss for your specific questions. Thank you very much, Taj, for that uh, uh, really uh, thought-provoking uh, co uh, commentary. Um, uh, Bolaji, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you now. Uh, really, you know, you're front and center in the gas business. Uh, I mean, recently the federal government talked about uh, auto gas as uh, a transformational tool. Uh, there, there was a network code which the NGA uh, championed. Um, now, how does the PIB, uh, Bolaji, how does the PIB play in all of this? I mean, if someone wants to go into the auto gas business, where does he find gas? You know, uh, who does he talk to? You know, it just uh, seems like, uh, like uh, you know, the more you look, the less you, you understand, you know. Uh, or can you, can you uh, share some comments in this, in this area and any other comments you have? Thank you, Mika, and good morning. Um, I will first of all like to make some general comments before I speak to the specific issue you raised. I think, in our opinion, the real missed opportunity is the fact that it has taken us 20 years to do this. Um, and we will find that there will never be a perfect regulation. We would only tend to perfection and uh, what we cannot do is to stand still. I think staying on this for 20 years is truly the missed opportunity, is, is what has put us in this situation that the whole industry has found itself. Um, and I think stakeholder divergence and detention is, is, is understood. There will be divergent interests anyway. And so I'm agreeing with uh, Taj that maybe it is time to look at whatever this portends and move on. Stay with the positives and let us collectively engage on the not so great over time. And it's a process. It's not, it's not an event, neither is it a specific milestone. We need regulation that will facilitate development. Uh, we need um, regulation that will bring in investments, both foreign and local. Uh, we need to be very clear about rights. People must be sure of what pertains for investments that they make. And I think that's the pain of it. Um, the new PIB or the yet to be passed PIB has some very great points. Personally, I think it's the great attempt at dealing with all the issues we've spent the last 20 years in seminars raising. It has some really great points. Uh, and I'd like to mention a few. Um, Dealing with infrastructure, um, dealing with regulation and the independence of regulation, uh, removing the conflicts of interest or the well-established conflicts of interest in the value chain, uh, dealing with the insecurity head-on and having some very strong pronouncements in that regard, I think are all very positive steps. Um, I even looked at the old area of the tariff, agreeing that it will be a consultative tariff mechanism, uh, 
fact-based. Um, dealing with co uh, customer protection or consumer protection, uh, dealing with trading and exports, um, community involvement, even being bold enough to have a, an infrastructure fund embedded. I think these are wonderful pointers to a well-crafted uh, uh, regulation. Uh, I wish it came 15 years ago. Certainly, if that happened, we won't be where we are today. And a lot would have happened, and I'm certain that even new, 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 new reviews would have made things even better. I start again by looking at what has come out from the governance side of the bill. Um, and I'd like to say, reconciling this with the regulatory fundamentals, particularly as expelled by OECD, it's, it's basically covers all points. It it's, 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 it's makes rules clearer. It talks about transparency. It talks about governance. It talks about funding. It talks about everything. I think the only missed point will be around performance evaluation, just making sure that it works, it flows from the policy, and even the regulators know that they will be evaluated in how well they move things over time. So in terms of how we can spur further developments, I think it's for the governance side to embed a performance evaluation part of it so that people feel the need to come and tell us where they are in their journeys and uh, beyond just um, giving returns on finances and audits. I think they should also give a balanced scorecard type report on, 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 the, on the roadmap or on the performance uh, that we set out initially. Um, I'd like to quickly talk about ways of improvements. Uh, I think I've concluded by saying, let's pass what we have, let's get going, and uh, we can continue to work on improvements over time. There are a few points I'd um, written in that regard. I think the first point is, I'm still a bit worried about the um, involvement of the ministries in those regulatory bodies. Uh, and whilst I understand why they've been put there, I would I will be advocating that there should be non-voting participation. So they have an awareness, but I'll be advocating that they are non-voting. Um, the second point is around funding. Uh, funding is critical. I mean, depending on where you are. Uh, we, we have lots of numbers being brandished, whether you say $55 billion or you say well in excess of that. So funding certainly going forward will be a major issue. And I think uh, the infrastructure fund, particularly around gas, will be scratching the surface. It will be too insignificant. And therefore, we probably need to bring into regulation other ways of encouraging or mobilizing partner or counterpart counterpart funding for all that we need to do so whether you call them grants subventions loans bonds whatever private equity whatever we need to do to encourage uh, more people to bring in funding into the sector i think it will be important uh, and i think we should learn from shipping and uh, the Nigerian content funds and be prompter in, in, in mobilizing and utilizing these funds. There's no point having a fund and for 15 years you don't disburse. I hope we don't get into that spiral uh, in, the, in the oil and gas side. Um, I think we need to pay a little more attention on the breakup of the, the breakup or transition of the national corporation the NMPC. I think the way we've captured it is too simplistic. Um, and I'm saying this smarting from, from the equivalent we saw when we broke up NEPA in the ESPRA. We would need a little more attention to that. Uh, we would certainly pay, pay more attention. I think we need to provide for some 
transitionary arrangements. It may even require a liability management company because there will be lots of things hanging as you try to transition a corporation that was both a regulator and a participant to strictly a commercial participant. So we, I, I, I think that's that's area that we need to, to pay more attention to. I was a bit taken aback by the fact that we're still trying to codify pricing in the schedule in the current PIB. I think that is counter counterproductive. We but I think it's been corrected because thankfully we now have a, a, a consultative process that is trying to put a framework around pricing. And I think it's it has to be that way, consultative, fact-based. You know, it can't be emotional. It's 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 it, it has to be that we tell you what the investment is and we tell you what the expected return is. And then you deal with that and balance it with all what the other Nigerian government's interests are, you know, so that we, 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 we take, we, we, we self-govern as, as a sector going forward. Without a doubt, it's clear that the fiscal terms are still the, the big issue. Uh, I listened very carefully to OPTS and Mbaya summarized what has been the conversation for the last three or four years uh, very well. Um, I think that's still an aspect we need to to rethink. And the, the, the way we know whether we are right or wrong is just to go back and do a competitive benchmark globally. If we're globally better, the capital will be mobilized. If we're not, you will not see it. So I think to the extent that it's a cause and, cause, and, cause, cause and effect, we don't even need to debate that too far. Uh, the, the government and the other stakeholders wait two, three years, and they know how uh, bad or good the fiscal terms are. Um, I think we need to stay on improving the investment conditions generally and, and let's mobilize uh, more, more capital and more activity into this sector. So Emeka, those are my uh, quick thoughts, but going back to your first question, the question around um, auto gas, I think we must first of all establish that it's a value chain effect. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with auto gas, and I think it is the way we should be thinking. We should use our endowments and our resources in all ways that can create multipliers for ourselves. And in that regard, I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of anything auto gas, whether you call it compressed natural gas or you call it NGVs or you call it auto gas, whatever types of gas that can help us fuel and move the economy. I think that will be supported. It is not a it is not a wand, a wish. It's a very gradual process. And we have examples. If you look at what's happening in Pakistan, Brazil, Argentina, even in um, some parts of Europe, very slow penetration. And it is not happening naturally. Governments must support. Everybody must pay the price of that gradual penetration. So I think we should encourage it. Uh, as a company, that we, we, we're, we're very keen on it. Uh, it's, not, it's not the most profitable segment, but trust that it's, it's a necessary segment if you truly want to put your money where your mouth is and say gas or natural resources would help you uh, catalyze your development going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polagia, for, for that uh, great contribution. You know, I, I think uh, it's been very interesting uh, the conversation so far. Um, uh, Audrey, I'm going to come back to Audrey, and then uh, Adiori, just hold on to all the, the comments. Uh, you know, Audrey, there's been this uh, common theme in the conversation so far, the, what I call the O-Mills team, or can manage it like that, you know, um, when it comes to the PIB. You know, it's not the best, but let's just manage it like that. Now, how do we how do we get gas going? 
you know, within the context of the PIB. There are some specific steps within this, but can manage it like that's PIB. You know, how can we really create a viable value chain in gas? Because everybody seems to have this idea that gas is the next big thing, but the how seems to be missing. You know, uh, there's a fair amount of frustration uh, with players who are in that, in that sector, as you well know. How do you think we can take advantage of this, uh, this uh, atmosphere uh, to, to, to kick gas, get gas going, uh, Audrey? So we, many things that need to be happening at the same time. And the, the PIB is not a 100% fix for the challenges we face in the gas sector. And in my opening comments, I did uh, allude to some of the legacy issues. But if we even look at um, uh, within the PIB, for instance, so if, if we're now talking about the authority and the commission, when we're looking at the enabling of investments, part of the constraints we face for instance, around this uh, multiplicity of agencies, you have to deal with so many regulators and all that. So I personally feel that if you even look at just the formation proposed for the commission and the authority, then it makes sense in, this, in looking at it as the streamlining of some, so you're, you're no more dealing with um, DPR, PPPRA, PEF and all that, you're now dealing with two bodies. And the, the way to make that work is that there must be an efficiency around the amalgamation of those bodies, one. Secondly, and Bolaji alluded to this in terms of performance management. So the, the, the concern when you look at the PIB in terms of the employees of these organizations that are going to be moved into this new um, two regulatory bodies that are being formed, are we taking everybody or are we taking the best people? Right. So who are who are those that are going to be working? What kind of alignment? And I want to use an analogy, for instance, if it's a bank that is merging with another bank, you know how difficult those things are. So what we don't want is a situation where in creating these two uh, commissions, we actually introduce a different kind of complexity into the regulatory space for the industry. It's going to be about the efficiencies there and also making sure that we knock off um, in so doing some of those rain seeking avenues that you know we see when we're dealing with too many regulators at the same time. Now, of course, pricing is an issue uh, in terms of enabling the gas investments, and we've talked about this. So yes, within the PIB, we saw that um, there was that provisioning for pricing, which was a huge concern. As NGA, we've pushed back to say, certainly that cannot be the case. We need to take that out completely. Once you legislate prices, you have already created a problem, right? So that's, that's another thing. So we expect then that outside of the PIB, the work that is being done, and those were some of the issues we discussed yesterday, to put a pricing framework that is more market-led that is you know, moving away from regulation allowing competition to thrive then we can see more projects coming to the fore it's very important also to note that the power sector um, is one of the biggest challenges we have even on the gas side because of the huge exposure that we have uh, in terms of the volumes and so one of the key uh, things that as a nation we should be looking at is how to create other offtake markets that then reduce that um, overarching dependency we have on the power sector for volumes such that when there are challenges in the power sector as is the current case the gas sector is not that badly impacted so we have to be thinking about the incentivization all across board from the investment point of view and this is the thing then so when you look at the PIB for instance um, the tax regime yes we say that it looks like the taxes are lo lower but we know that we still have the gas gas um, side of the business being taxed on CIT at 30 percent when we're talking about building a, a vibrant gas sector when we're talking about leveraging on um uh, what's it called our gas resources to enable other sectors of economy actually would have expected some more incentivization around gas that would have made sense all right in my view i think it would have made sense for us to look at how what else can we give and yesterday we talked about how if we all have the same kind of incentives around the nlng model for instance you would have seen more investments coming to the fore um we've talked about uh, some sanctity of contracts right that being an issue that we still hope that in the process of transitioning to the PIB will be dealt with. So there are issues around um, the migration of contracts, uh, the grandfathering arrangements and so on. And the concerns that some of the clauses that are proposed within the PIB, it's almost as if you are, you are being penalized for an existing framework. You know, so so that doesn't quite give the sense of comfort to investors, um, especially when you're looking at it from a long-term play. Already we have existing frameworks that were 
uh, planned for 20, 30 years ahead, and now we're shifting the, the goalposts, so to speak. That's not a bad problem because we're trying to restructure the industry, but making room for those transition periods that recognize that there is a um, an unbundling that needs to happen of existing contracts into the, the newer ones. Now, I think also it's important to pick on a point OK had raised in his, in his opening presentation, and this was around um, the regulatory alignment, you know, the, you were talking about administrative complexities that come, especially because you now have, uh, you have a lot of integrated projects within the gas industry, but we're now looking at two different commissions that will be regulating upstream and then midstream and downstream. We have to be able to fine tune that. Um, it's going to take us a while, even though it's the thrust of the gas policy, it's going to take us a while to get to that, you know, actual unbundling and disaggregation of the value chain in real terms. Right? I think that's the process that, again, a transitional framework has to be looked at. And uh, maybe lastly, at this point in time, if I want to talk about how we can enable, and I'm looking at it from the assumption that by January, February, March, we're going to have a working PIB, because the way the, the National Assembly is moving, I know that stakeholder engagement should be happening early in the new year, and then we should get um, all being well presidential assent by, by um, end of Q1. So if we now look at it from that perspective of um, what are the things that need to happen very quickly? We know that even the issue around NMPC Limited can grossly impact on your investments because about the signaling to existing investors as well as to prospective investors. And this is something we need to be continuously mind mindful of. What is it that we're um, signaling? Yes, we want to move ahead with this PIB, but in this period where we still have some room to negotiate, do stakeholder engagements, I think the language has to be incentivization, incentivization, incentivization. Um, OK talked about government take and how we should reduce that. And I think it's important to put that out there, that we have to create uh, a better um, return for prospect prospective investors. We cannot pull capital back, right? Unless it can see that it's going to attract a lot of returns, especially in the climate that we're in today. So government has to be able to take a longer term view of saying, you know what, in the short term, we will do a, a lower take so that it is the investors who are putting their money on the ground, who are the ones that are having to deal with the industry risks and all that, that are getting the higher portion of the take. And that's where we bring more people to the table. You see more projects and the multiplier benefits are then, you know, something that everybody can enjoy and the government themselves benefit from that. Of course, also taking into cognizance that there are social, socioeconomic benefits that go with all, you know, the enabling of um, different types of projects within and outside of the gas sector. So I'm going to anchor my comments around that to say that there are too many things. Uh, we cannot just think that the PIB is the one-stop solution. It is imperative to have it in place, but we must have the discipline to address some of the other structural and systemic challenges we've been talking about in the gas sector for so long now. Right? Thanks, Emeka. Thank you very much, Audrey. Thank you, man. Well, you know, um, uh, Adeoye, I'm, I'm coming to you now. Uh, you know, you, you talked about uh, the fact that we have, uh, there are complex interests in our industry and we need to work together, right? Now, the PIB provides for splitting up the regulatory bodies into three, upstream, midstream, and downstream. Uh, there's a fair amount of overlap because uh, there are very few standalone gas projects, as it were. Um, how much of dispute res uh, resolution or mediation is there uh, not just between contracting parties, because I mean, Audrey talked about sanctity of contracts, but even with the regulator today, uh, I don't know what your experience is, but uh, from all intents and purposes, the regulator is the judge and the jury, um, and you and they and they uh, they just that's it. You just you just, you just can't go anywhere else. Um, so, what happens now with the PIB for an investor? Is there some greater comfort? Uh, how do we align all these complex interests, particularly between agencies? Uh, thank you, Emeka. And um, you know, I listened to all the wonderful contributions from everybody. And a lot of people have touched on you know, the evolution of the regulator. Um, I know that the objective is to create strong, independent regulators. Um, my first comment would be, Typically, when you are to pass a law, 
um, uh, you know, government will issue a policy document which kind of outlines you know, their vision, not for two years, not for three years, but a long-term vision. And that policy document anticipates all the challenges that the industry will face. And we have such a document. Uh, we have a petroleum policy and a, an oil policy, rather, and a gas policy. Uh, both of which outlined the type of regulator we have and the, you know, um, the kind of the structure of the regulator. Both of them suggested that we have one regulator uh, to cover the entire gamut of the industry. Um, and this PIB is a departure from that. We don't have any explanation for why that is the case. Um, why is why is a single regulator better than a, a, a dual regulator? Well, you know, it depends. It's all about context. The context we found ourselves, unfortunately, in Nigeria is that there is a lot of competition between regulators. So instead of the regulators working together to deliver a result for Nigeria, for the Nigerian government, everybody's trying to lay hold of their own area. The challenge is compounded when we have supposedly strong independent regulator, which means that uh, they have their own, uh, they, they brought their own mandate, uh, and the likelihood that someone will be able to mediate between them as regulators is going to be difficult. And uh, having them foist, uh, and what that means is when the two elephants are fighting, Clearly, the grass will suffer. Who's the grass here? You know, the grass is the industry and, and the consumers. And unfortunately, when we look through the, the PIB, uh, there is no clarity in terms of how do we, as, um, as industry, resolve our disputes with the regulator. Because it will happen. It happens now, and it will continue to happen. When you have a, a strong independent regulator uh, you do not want that strong independent regulator to act in an arbitrary manner there are a few protections that the PIB provides uh, some of which I think are very useful but need to be expanded on first the, the, the PIB says that the regulators must give reasons for taking an action that's an important point uh, the ability or the requirement for them to give reasons uh, means that they have to consider what the actions they are taking and the implications of that action. But that requirement to give reasons is is not it is at their discretion, and I think that that kind of throws away the whole uh, requirement itself. They have an obligation to consult when they want to issue regulations. That's good. But again, there are exceptions for when they will consult. So I would tighten those kind of provisions. What else would I like to see around regulatory authority and responsibility? Well, I think that we must leave the days where uh, the regulator, before taking a decision, uh, doesn't talk to the industry and the regulator does not consider the impact of its regulatory actions on the industry. So the introduction of a system of regulatory impact assessments into our uh, regulatory sphere, I think would be very, very useful in it. Um, and hopefully, Emeka, I've answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, touch. You know, uh, Emeka, but, just to, but just to quickly say, there's still the federal court process. Even the PIB accepts that there's a federal court process. Yeah, the interesting, interesting that you raised this point. Um, now that would take us into another another realm. You know, uh, uh, are you bold enough, courageous enough to take uh, the regulator to court? You know, uh, you know, that is, those are the issues now that um, 
we begin to 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 delve into and uh, then if you do, do do that are you going to be guaranteed that they can move at oil industry speed uh to resolve an issue so in a way uh we are uh, it kind of heads you do lose tails you win or heads you lose tails you lose as the case may be but that's an interesting uh, comment uh, apology um but i mean since you're talking about this let's let's look at the issue of cost industry costs operations. I mean, the bottom line is that the Nigerian oil industry and the gas industry is probably one of the highest uh, in terms of the cost profile. And you can easily allude it to all the reasons, uh, uh, security, uh, you know, pandemic, <laughs> recession, uh, you know, all that stuff, militancy, vandalization. But there's something that is front and center in the PIB, which is all the taxes and duplicity of taxes has been mentioned here. Uh, and almost that we, we get into the tax, tax taxation fatigue type of arrangement. Touch, I don't know, how can the PIB address this? I mean, is this something that we can we can look at, at least solve one part of the complex equation? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Emeka. So the, 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 the issue you just touched on is actually multifaceted. Uh, because you, you can look at it from the aspect of that, okay, all right, uh, as an investor, what do I desire from an investment? You should like levy 200 types of taxes, provided it still gives me an acceptable risk return that I think that my investment deserves. I won't blink over it. The only thing I'll blink over is the administrative inconvenience. But, but if you, can, you can also look at it from the lens of how, what does it do to our ability to attract investment? And how does it, and whether indeed um, ability that people see, so when they are talking about rate of investment, are they seeing that as additional cost? Uh, and, and I think that's what, that's the bit that is a bit more important to discuss. Um, so there are all sorts of levies in this industry. And I think it's coming from the fact that uh, most government agencies know that indeed um, uh, this is the backbone of our economy. This is where the money is in. If you are looking for dollars, uh, you have to look towards the industry. Um, and so, and, and that's what has led us to where we are, where you can, even there was a bill, the last one I saw, there was a police service commission being created and a levy is also included uh, in there. Um, very recently, we saw the um, attempt to amend the NCDB bill uh, and increasing by 100% uh, what the industry needs to cover out. In a period where even the ministry, NMPC, is saying we should reduce costs, it, it's just sometimes uh, uh, unbelievable sometimes what we see. But my, my perspective to it is, is simple. Uh, EB, PIB tries to manage it by saying that uh, consultation needs to be made with the regulator in such ways. But I think it's, 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 it's far too uh, short of what I think will protect the industry. Um, a, a, a more uh, definitive uh, provision that no further uh, levy should be made in the industry is what I think we need in PID. The reason why I think we need that is, is simple. Uh, I sat with some group of gentlemen looking how to model the new PID yesterday. And you know what? Most of the uh, levies that I see, they don't see it because they are not practitioners in the industry. They don't even know that the PID has made education tax not to be more, that it used to be tax deductible. It's no more tax deductible. PID has done that. I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. But what I'm saying is that the big issue in relation to the fees and levies we see is that they are hidden. They are simply hidden. So if you see a competitiveness assessment of Nigeria against some other climate, you don't see that. Are they cost? Are they government pay? The jury is out there. But what, what I think we need, we need legal protection in the PID that will ensure that no levy is uh, imposed on the industry without a uh, being underpinned by a proper regulator or regulation that will bring the industry high ball to high ball so that the impact and the unwanted consequences of it can be brought to the fore. Take the issue of security in Nigeria. Um, yeah, 
time in the industry, even, yeah, yeah. This week in the industry, you, you, you need resources, resources. There's no way our cost competitiveness can be the same as other climates until we take away some of the non-technical risks that exist in our business, for example. Uh, and, and that's the bane of some of those levels. The other bit of it is just need for protection, which I think the language in PRB it is strengthened to actually help a little bit. And if there's proper, if the regulator actually is independent and is, is properly uh, fulfilling its role, perhaps uh, putting performance evaluation, including this uh, as a requirement for the regulator, it will also help the process. But certainly today, uh, all these levies and administrative fees is uh, from stevedoring charges to, to to all sorts, even to a development levy by states. And some the amounts they are charging sometimes is unbelievable. It's as if it's an indirect route to get their share of the revenue, uh, a little bit more than that comes from the center. So I, I think it's a problem. And I think two solutions to help. One is to ensure that the it becomes a performance metric for the regulator. And also the language in PID is very strength, is strengthened, much more strengthened than what it is today. So that nobody can stand up, put a bid together in National Assembly and uh, bring a new levy on the industry without anybody knowing it until when the bill is allowed being passed, you know, as we used to see in the past. And that would be my comment. So thank you very much. You know, uh, you talked about yeah, you talked about this uh, this whole idea of uh, milking the cow or harvesting the golden eggs, you know, through taxation. Uh, it's it's very interesting that you say that. Um, Bolaji, please. Uh, uh, there were some very very interesting questions that have come up in the Q and A. Um, again, talking about uh, incentives for switching to gas. You talked about the the infrastructure fund. Uh, you are a practitioner, and I know you've had to deal with uh, how to raising massive amounts of, uh, of, of investment uh, in projects, uh, you know, that are uh, ongoing. Uh, what what would you say? How what kind of strategy do you think uh, that we can we can derive in terms of uh, incentivizing the the industry, the gas industry? Uh, we can talk about the PIB, but we need to speak up as it were, from what you said earlier, we need to speak up and embrace and convince the policymakers that uh, indeed, uh, we need to step out of the way to deliberately grow, for example, the auto gas, auto, auto gas uh, or, or um, NGV uh, industry, it doesn't happen by just by, by organic means, you know? Uh, what, what would you say would be a, a strategy that, uh, that's viable for Nigeria as a country? Thank you, Emeka. Uh, I think, um as far as capital mobilization is concerned, it's really about proofing the markets. And that's why we're very particular about the critical markets that ultimately take our gas. Uh, export markets is the reason why export markets are prioritized because it's a well-proven, reliable, bankable market space. And that's why the power sector is not prioritized, even though a big taker. It's because we've over time not been able to depend on those cash flows in a stable, reliable manner. And so my straight answer to that will be, let us spend time maturing and proofing the markets in a manner that we will be assured that capital will be will flow on encumbered. Um, and what do we need to specifically do? I think the first point is, can we just make sure that the markets get gas at fair prices, competitive, globally competitive prices? Gas is a commodity. Uh, if you suppress one against the other markets in the world, then you do yourself the disservice. Uh, there was an argument as to whether we should only price gas in Naira. I think that will be dead on arrival. 
because then you just worsen an already fragile local market. We should be trying to prove the market and make it just as competitive as all the markets that can attract the same gas. That will be my one only solution to, to this. Let's, let's, let's make the markets attractive and then capital will flow. We won't even need any further incentive. The, the markets would make sense and funds and capital and uh, resources will be so mobilized. Well, Aji, don't, don't go away. Uh, there was a question from an anonymous uh, contributor about uh, the issue of funding of the regulators. If they are supposed to be self-funding, then the, the fundamental performance uh, uh, metric, the KPI for them, will be how much money they generated from government. And then we fall into this trap of trying to create pseudo taxes and costs so that they can milk this cow. <laughs> so uh, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the take? Is it, and this, if they're 100% self-funding, then we are snookered because it means that, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the goose is all they're going, that's where they're going to be harvesting the eggs. No, I think uh, saying it correctly, the PIB actually um, has a number of um, ways in which the regulator, both the commission and the authority, can be funded. And I think uh, fees and fines is the only one. They also have subventions. I mean, they also have subventions. They also have grants. They also have uh, multilateral supports. So it's not the only way. Uh, but the question you raise is the question with most, most regulators in all spheres. Um, and I think it's the strength and the, and the integrity of the of the players in those um, bodies that would determine if they will take advantage of, of their fines and fees. Um, I think also if the rules are very well laid out and clear, uh, then you're not struggling with whether you'll be snookered by a, a poor, poor, poor operating regulator. I think, I think most regulators worldwide have the strength of the fees and fines, but it's, it really shouldn't be abused if you have the right people in there. Thank you very much. We have, we have about uh, two minutes to go. Uh, uh, this has been a very engaging session. Yeah. There, are, there are two sides to the, coin, to the coin. One is fees and money they make, the other is their spend. One other way of checkmating the regulator is to regulate their spend. Strict condition of service. Um, because once you do that and they don't have appetite to spend the money, they won't depend on the industry for the fees. They also an addition. Okay, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, at least a service level agreement with the industry to deliver on um, how they spend the money. That's excellent. Now we have about a minute or two to finish. Uh, now there's something that we haven't talked about, which is the AFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Agreement. We have literally 10 seconds each for each of the panelists. Is this an opportunity or is it just uh, a, a pipe dream? Do we see the AFCTA uh, as an opportunity for the Nigerian oil and gas industry in what way? Just very quickly, Audrey, can you take that up and then we just run all the way through. Right, my comment would be that it is supposed to be an opportunity. <laughs> very simple. So that we just tell ourselves the truth. We are not ready to take advantage of that. We need to deal with many issues internally before we can take advantage of after. And that's the reality. So I, I think it's an opportunity that exists and we should be mindful of. But I think that we should literally pay a lot of attention to resolving the issues we have in country, building additional capacity to enable us to be competitive across the continent. Uh, I'll keep it at that. I hope that was 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, uh, touch, please. So um, I'm very close to what Audrey has said. I see it as a future opportunity. I don't like taking any opportunity. I don't like taking kicking any ball in the front. So uh, what I will, I will, I will parallel what uh, the recommendation of Audrey. So indeed, there are internal issues we need to do. But if we leave, if we don't take it and find a way to start doing the policy framework, the need to flow gas to our manufacturing plants so they can produce things and then be able to export. We need to run things in parallel. We are far behind. That would be my 10 seconds. 
Okay, Bolaji. It's a it's a natural opportunity because if if we got it right, we will be the fuel for all those localized production in all those countries. Uh, we should be the biggest beneficiaries of that of that uh, act. Um, it's unfortunate where things are, uh, but I think it's not all lost yet. I mean, we see a lot of movements in the region on account of ACFA, people just gearing up to produce what they have local comparative, comparative advantage on. And, and that's, that's also business. It's exports, but it's still business. Um, but it would be nice that we can at least use our own gas locally and, and do what we need to do such that we can fulfill domestic consumption and still export too. So it's 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 both a potential, but it's it would have been a natural opportunity. Um, and like many opportunities about what to do with it, um, and everybody has talked about what we can be doing with it. Let's get some. Thank you so much. The thing is that uh, uh, the. The, the uh, NGA has decided that this has been such an interesting exercise. They've given us an extra five or ten minutes. Amazing. You know? ah, yeah, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So because now the thing is this. Now, we are talking of the AFTA and we are saying it's the future opportunity. But this thing has been signed off huh? and it's kicking off Q1 of 2021. We're out of time. What do we do? Are we going to be flooded by, sorry to say, Chinese and uh, other country uh, products overnight? Literally next quarter, we're going to be faced with AFCTA. What do we do? What can NGA, what can the industry do uh, to manage it like that? Uh, Audrey. <laughs> right. Um, Emeka, if we would face our realities, and I, I, I like to be very realistic, we are just not in the most advantageous of positions. When you look at the manufacturing space, when you look at our industrial um, sector, so from a competitiveness index, we are very low. And there is nothing you're going to do overnight. That's the truth. So even if we can identify some quick wins now, they're still going to take some time to unfold. So Q1, is there's nothing changing by, two, by Q1. This is our reality. And this is the problem of not addressing issues head on in a timely and efficient manner. So, so many things, I mean, it's literally like the last 20 years are crashing around us now. That's our reality. So there are no quick fixes and we have to be ready to deal with that. Um, I saw something, I think there's a question in the chat box, in the Q&A box, and it was asking around um, the cost, the switching cost for, for the autogas um, project. You know what, Polaji, I don't remember, where you and I, is maybe 15 years, 16 years ago in Abuja, we had a conversation around autogas and the conversion kits. At that point in time, what was the dollar rate? Our economy was in a stronger place. If we had done some of the things that we're discussing doing now in terms of enabling auto gas, we would have not been having the same conversation today. So th this is our reality. A lot of the economic fundamentals are in a bad place. Let's not expect overnight success. Nothing can happen in Q1. However, does that mean we should sit back and let and do nothing? No. But then again, it's about taking the bull by the horn and addressing the issues that need to be addressed. And whether we like it or not, again, the narrative around gas. Gas is what is going to take us out of this challenge. So are we getting gas right? Are we getting it right? The answer is no. We are still looking at it as if just by making pronouncements, there will be a turnaround. That's not mm. it. When Tad was talking, he said you can't compel investments. You can't. You attract it. This is the reality. Do we realize that there are Nigerians who are literally taking their money to invest outside the country? Because it makes sense. So, I mean, just so I don't go on, I'm very passionate about this issue of turning the, the country around, but there will, be no, there will be no quick fixes. We have to do the hard work. We need to be ready to take the knocks. So the question, the person asking about um, how come it costs 200,000 for a conversion kit? It's the same way we as the investors are saying, do you realize the costs we deal with? Everything is important. We have so many overheads. 
locally and internationally. We have so many taxes, so many levies, so many, so many issues, and all of them add on to the cost. And then we are saying that we then need to have prices that help us to make sense of these investments, and everybody is up in arms about pricing. These are the issues. <laughs> these are the issues. So let's just know that there is room. It's an opportunity for us. We will walk into it, but we're going to be playing catch up. That's our Absolutely. truth. However, however, I know that if you do the right sets of, sets of things, your catch up may be for a period, but there is still potential to ac to accelerate and excel even beyond those who were. I mean, first mover advantages usually last only so long. A small player can come from the back and go past you very quickly if they have the right sets of strategies. They are focused and determined to do that, and that's what Nigeria needs to be doing right now. Thanks, we hear you. We hear you, Audrey. Uh, Bolaji. Audrey mentioned the conversation you had. So how how do we play this game now? <laughs> do we keep up? Three years ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, you know, I I generally take the view that you make the best of whatever situations you find yourself. I mean, it's, it's just the pragmatic way to progress. Um, this, the man of industrial subsector in Nigeria has, has, has been doing well trying to improve its energy sources. Um, unfortunately, I think we've not been as fast in providing the infrastructure to support them. Um, and each time we've done so, they've embraced it and they've moved on and done even better. Um, even for the other AGFA countries, they are still looking to us to supply gas from Nigeria, whether down Cameroon or in the West Coast. So um, the point I'm making is there's no turn, there's no switch, there's no turn on you must just go through the gestation. You must create the enabling environment. People must build infrastructure before we can start to, to pr propel, propel industrialization. So it will come, but maybe the, the, the point of ACFA now is just that we, we need to make those steps, take those steps today. And they're a bit more realistic. The other countries are a bit more realistic even with, uh, with with the price of, of gas. I mean, they understand that there's an infrastructure, they're happy to pay for it, and we're finding it easier to even place uh, molecules outside Nigeria than we are finding it to place it domestically. So that, that it's, it's, it's almost ironic, but that's, that's the situation. Interesting. Touch. Yeah. we're almost uh, done. So just the uh, last word and then we are done. Uh, <laughs> Which one has shown up? So it's time for us to wind, wind up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I think uh, very good points have been made. Really. But honestly, it's, uh, uh, I think it's the evils of the past that is catching up on us. But notwithstanding, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. Um, so if I look at the economy of Nigeria, there are certain sectors which I think are more ready than certain sectors. Take the IT sector. I think they are more ready than the manufacturing sector. So I think we could start seeing some elite elements of benefit of after. So I think signing and getting on board is the right thing to do. Um, so when it kickoffs next year, there are the certain sector that will need all the enablers we've been talking about before they can even make any impact. But there will be some other sectors that could start inching forward and taking advantage of it. And I think that's the way to go. We just need to keep progressing and never stop and sorting out our problems and keep progressing and keep progressing. I will get that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we had such an awesome time together. I think uh, uh, from the comments, it's, it's really been a good uh, conversation. Uh, you know, uh, there's this uh, adage that, you know, uh, you don't use pits to take a bath when you live beside a, a, a river. What? And <laughs> the theme that is, that is all across board is the fact that we seem to be using the pits uh, our own speech to, to take baths. Meanwhile, we all live beside a big river. Thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, uh, and thank you for NGA for, for hosting this, uh, this, this platform. Um, Richmond, back to you. Thank you very I would much. Have wondered, I would have wondered where the proverbs went to if I did not hear one at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Mr. NM. My goodness, that was quite engaging, quite informative, and um, everything put on the table. And I hope all those that need to hear this are definitely going to be hearing this. And you all deserve a resounding applause for this job that you have done here today. We truly appreciate you. You know, you know what I say. You know what I say about people uh, to my delegates, rather, when it comes to Q and A uh, at events like this. Now, while I'm concluding this event, you can see ask your questions. Now, the reason for that is you never can tell. Your question or comment could be what will inform a topic tomorrow, um, a panel tomorrow, or a speaker tomorrow. So go ahead, ask your questions, but we may not be able to provide you with the answers as the session has ended. But I'm sure NGA can capture it if it is relevant to, the, to a future discourse and put it together to form the basis for conversation. That said, this brings us to the close of the multi logs for 2020. No thanks to COVID-19. I would have been shaking hands and hugging with some of you in the room if we had met in this, if we had met in these um, um, venues we have in Lagos. Well, hopefully the COVID would vanish, hopefully. And in the first quarter of 2021, we'll meet again. It might be hybrid. It might be on site. It might be online. You never can tell. Whatever the case would be, be sure that NGA would advance these conversations to the corridors of those that need to hear all that is being said here today. They will engage. They will definitely create opportunities for gas to get the kind of attention that it deserves to get moving forward in this industry. PIB, let me close by saying again what I said yesterday. An honorable member was full of excitement when he said to me that they are passing the PIB. I hope that some excitement is what we catch when we all see the PIB make you know, its way into the industry in the near future. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nigeria LNG. Thank you to Shell and thank you to Axela. You have made this possible this year and I'm sure NGA cannot wait for another handshake with you in the future. That said, for all NGA members, remember 1 p.m. exactly 1300 as GMT plus one, we will be commencing your AGM and you know what follows there at the AGM. See you, that will be that will be in exactly one hour and two minutes. I will see all NGA members on back the link that you have. Ladies and gentlemen, that will be it for today. My name is Richmond Osuji. Uh, Modion Communications, uh, one of the fastest ri rising uh, brand communications company in Nigeria, has put this together. And it's been my pleasure of coming to serve you as master of ceremony. I like to say, as the Italians would say, Arrivederci. Bye-bye.